Well, good morning. Because I know you'll be talking about this, I just wanted to give you a little clarification. According to the song, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Santa actually had 12 reindeer. Uh, you know, Dasher, Dancer, Prancer, Vixen, Comet, Cupid, Donner, Blitzen. There's eight. Rudolph is nine. Then there's Olive. You know, all of the other reindeer. That's 10. 11 is how. You know, you know, then how the reindeer loved him. Yeah, okay. And uh, 12 is Andy. Andy shouted out with glee. Uh, so the proof is in the song. So if you happen to have a bet at the Christmas dinner table, remember to tithe. Okay, that's what I'm going to say. So I'm going to talk a little bit about prayer this morning, which I thought would be a good thing for us as we sort of uh, move to the end of the year and start to prepare for another new year ahead. Um, for us as students of the science of mind, I think people who are in the science of mind are the most praying people that, that I know. The Ernest Holmes teaches us that we have to pray and meditate every day to really have transformation. That he says these two things are necessary. Prayer, because we set spiritual law in motion, and meditation, because that's how we court the presence. And so Einstein said, um, I want to think God's thoughts. All the rest are details. And I think that's where we're trying to get to in our process, in our practice of prayer. So a couple of things are absolutely necessary. And the first is a realization that the creative spirit is always at work. God is always on the job. And the universal mind uh, reacts to our thought according to spiritual law. So what we think into the universal mind, the law of the universe gives back to us. You know, we do not compel uh, this force, this infinite intelligent force, to work. Your prayer does not influence God. I think this is really important for us to understand. God is already doing all that God is going to do. Right now, God's already doing it, okay? Now, I don't know about you, but I came from a background where my idea of God was sort of like a combination of Santa Claus, bellboy, hitman. That was my God, you know? <laughs> that I, I sort of thought that God had all of those attributes and abilities. It was sort of combination Santa Claus, bellboy, hitman. Now, coming into Science of Mind, I realized, wow, I had a long way to go in my thinking about what God, God was. So, you know, we pray, and then we try to maintain um, a calm, expectant manner, but at the same time, a deep inner conviction that, that it's absolutely happening. See, the work is effective because the law is always, always in operation. People will sometimes say to me, well, I did a treatment on Monday, and the treatment felt really good, so I know that one really worked. But on Tuesday, I treated again, and I didn't really feel anything, so that wasn't a good treatment. And I always tell people, you know, it's absolutely. If you can get feeling into your treatment, that's a great thing. If you can get feeling in the prayer, that makes it even more effective. However, because the law of the universe is all responding to what we say and what we think, even if you didn't get all tingly in your own prayer, it's still a good prayer because the law is responding to what you say. You're setting the law in motion with your words. So, you know, for us as students of the science of mind, I, I think it's important to remember that health and happiness and having our needs met and having love in our life, all of these are part of our divine heritage. God does not want for anybody to be sick or anybody to be broke, or God does not need any of that. God does not want, period. God simply is. So think about it. A God that we could influence, like, oh, please, 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 God. You know that prayer. I have done it many times before Science of Mind, and occasionally since Science of Mind. Um, that would not be a very big or powerful God, would it? Would it? You know what I mean? So in the Science of Mind, when we are talking about prayer, it's no begging, it's no beseeching. You know, also a God that answered some prayers and not others would be a pretty, uh, would not be a very righteous God, I guess is what I want to say there. That again, God is always doing everything that God is going to do. So what happens is we pray, and in that process of praying, we get in alignment with what God is already doing. In that process of our praying, our consciousness gets lifted, and we start going in the direction that the river is flowing. 
So Eric Butterworth, in his wonderful book, Spiritual Economics, which is one of my all-time favorites, said, we don't affirm to make something true. We affirm because it is true already in the mind of God. This is very different than I will pray and affirm to make something happen. I'm going to affirm and I'm going to make it happen. That's not it. It's already done in the mind of God. So, so there is a spiritual us who is never sick. There's a spiritual part of us that's never uh, in need. There's a spiritual part of us that's never confused or afraid, who is never caught up by any kind of negative thinking. As I pray, my idea of God has to also be different, right? That God is not like Amazon.com, you know, where I decide what I want and the universe just sends it to me. You know, God, I'm lonely, send me a mate. No, God simply is a principle of love itself. And in that principle of love, there is relationship. You know, God, you know, God is, um, when we say, oh, God, I'm unemployed, you know, could you send me a job? No, God is the principle of abundance. And in that abundance, there is perfect creative expression for each and every one of us. Oh, God, I'm sick, please send me a healing. You know, no, God simply is the principle of health. And when we get in alignment with that principle of health and know that health is the truth about us, then we demonstrate that. So our prayer is a revealing of what God already is, a revealing of what God has already created. So what if every time we prayed, we knew God has already said yes? I mean, think about that. Before we pray that God has already said yes, then the prayer is not to change God, but it's about changing us. It's about lifting our consciousness. It's about opening up our receptivity to believe and accept what God is giving to us all of the time. You know, so prayer, I think, is essential to the conscious well-being of our individual soul. You know, now, I think what we have to cultivate as students of the science of mind is we have to cultivate a willingness to go to God simply for God, not to get the goods, okay? We go to God we remember the truth. We go to God, we remember our connection with God and with each other. You know, that, that transformed is to, the, the, the meaning of transformed is to radically produce self-change, right? But to transcend, this is interesting to me, is to overcome limit or to move beyond the self. Uh, it's, it's a little gentler, and it feels to me like it's a little higher up. To transcend is to rise above that place where I even think there's a problem. You know, so practice, when, I, when we do our spiritual practice, you know, this gives me something to do while um, our own natural evolution takes place. You know, sometimes we pray and we pray and we pray for something again and again and again, and we think, gee, God's just not responding. But it's not that God's not responding. It's that that period of time is what it takes to change and lift our thinking. We need that amount of time to change our consciousness. Look, everybody's consciousness is the way it is because it's taken years to get to where we are. And so we decide now, I want to have healing. I want love in my life. I want to have abundance. That's fine. The universe says yes. And the universe has already created all of those things. So what has to change? Nothing out here. What has to change is all inside of me. You know, uh, Emma calls it uh, the way of wisdom. And she says that in the way of wisdom, to be meek is yielding to the highest spiritual principle we know in any situation. It's like, so what's the highest spiritual principle we know in any situation? So Ernest used to say it like this. He'd say, our message is simple in the science of mind. He would say to his ministers, he would say, our message is this. God is all there is. Now you go figure out 52 different ways to say that. You know, because that was, that was essentially you know, what we sort of have to uh, figure out. Uh, is 52 ways, 52 Sundays of God is all there is. But if I just told you God is all there is, well, I wouldn't see you for another 51 weeks. So, um, uh, <laughs> um, like any relationship, if you just go to God when you have a problem, when you're in trouble, then that's not going to be a very good relationship. I mean, think about that. If you had a friend and all your friend ever did was call you when they had a problem. Never just to get together for fun or to have a cup of coffee or visit or catch up, but they only called when they wanted to back up the dump truck and share liberally with you everything that is not working in their life. If we have a relationship with God that is like that, um, that's not very good, you know? That's not a good thing. See, I think we want to be having an ongoing relationship with God, with the infinite, so that when things are difficult, 
then we are already well ensconced in that relationship. You know, what if we're doing spiritual practice and that, uh, you know, and, and all along, right? It, because it seems to me that if we're practicing all along, if we're praying, if we're meditating, if we're giving our attention to God, if we're affirming, if we're doing all these good things that we teach in the science of mind, well, first of all, if we're doing that, even when we think, I don't need to be doing this now because I don't have a problem. If we're doing it all along, it seems to me that a lot of the problems are not even going to crop up because God already has our attention, right? We're already thinking about that within us, within the world, within life. That's the highest and best. And I think we're destined, you know, as I've said again and again, that we are destined to become deep people spiritually. You know, during, um, during the Trojan War, uh, in uh, this, this Trojan War is like the most famous episode of Greek mythology. When Achilles was a child, uh, his mother, uh, Thetis, she dipped him uh, in the river Styx. And in doing so, he became invulnerable except for the part of his heel that she held him by, hence his Achilles heel. Now, Achilles was a great warrior, but he did have this heel. That was his one spot that was... Uh, not invincible. Now, similarly, I think that all of us have an Achilles heel. Uh, the one area that we are not able to force into being better, you know, that area seems to me to be the thing that is presented to us because that's what forces us to go deeper spiritually. It's what forces us to get really serious. I think it, it, it is. It's, it's, it's our soul's invitation to say, you know what? You can't just handle this the way you've been handling other stuff. You have to go to a deeper place. You know, in Genesis, Jacob wrestles with an angel. Uh, and it's near daybreak. And, and he holds on to the angel. And the angel says, let me go. And he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And I think that's just a great thing. I will not be through with this condition, this experience, until I get the blessing out of it, which I think so often... We think, I just need for this to go away. I just want it to go away. And what we need to be asking ourselves is, what's the blessing in this? Because it's not apparent. It's not going to be obvious right away. Jacob knew, though, that with the blessing of God, he had conquered all of his old, weaker self. So, so humanly, I think we try to, for, to figure things out and explain them at the level of consciousness, but uh, the, the level of consciousness where we are most of the time. So, you know, if you are at that level of consciousness where you feel like a victim most of the time, then the explanation is always going to be, well, I'm a victim. They did it to me. But, you know, if you, as, as we progress in consciousness, then we see, oh, this has more to do with me, with a reflection of some belief, some thought, some idea within me that's come up now. And the reason it's come up now is because now I have the ability to actually really have healing. You know, uh, the, um, it's, a, it's like doing this spiritual practice in the science of mind. It occurred to me that this is like rewiring your house from 110 to 220. You know, that, that, uh, that otherwise there's just uh, too much energy flowing through and, and it would burn us up. So how will I deal with my Achilles heel, with my difficulty in life, with, with my uh, area that I just cannot affirm it into being better? You know, I, can, I think I can deal with it with material means. I've certainly tried to do that again and again. Or I can turn to what is internal. And, and if we turn to what is internal, what I believe uh, not internal, I, I can turn to what is eternal. If we turn to what is eternal, then I believe when we deal with it, we really are dealing with it, and it's gone forever. You know, in suffering, it seems to me the soul needs to practice. You know, it's like the suffering that we experience can pierce our heart and open people to a place of being willing to go deeper spiritually. Because suffering turns us to the truth as a way to end the suffering. That's what it is, right? So if and when we are, are, are turned to the light, you know, all the time, you know, if that is our focus, if our focus is always toward the light, toward the highest and best within us, toward seeing the highest and best within other people, toward giving ourselves a break, toward giving other people a break, then, then there is actually less suffering. Because, you know, suffering is always about wrong action. And it seems to me that, that when we can find what there is in our life to be grateful for, then that is right action. And I think one of the best ways to do that is to just quite simply, um, so I saw um, a few minutes of Bing Crosby and Rosemary Clooney the other day, and uh, 
And they were singing, you know, if you're worried and you can't sleep, just count your blessings instead of sheep. And I thought there was actually a spiritual principle involved in that because people tell me again and again how they get so worried about things and they get worked up about them and they just, they can't sleep at night because they're chewing on them, going over them over and over and over and over again. And, and I was thinking about Bing and Rosemary and I thought, you know, my good friends, now, now spiritual teachers for me too. Uh, <laughs> And I thought, you know, it's, when you lay there, I could just lay there and be neurotic and stay up all night long with my neuroses, or I could just think, what are all the ways that I feel blessed? All the ways that good is in my life. And I start to think about that, and I think about that, and, you know, count your blessings instead of sheep. Let's pray. Okay. So, we try, thanks. So we turn our attention inward now for a moment to just remember that we are surrounded and filled with God's infinite loving spirit, God's joy, God's peace, God's abundance. It's all right here where we are, that God's spirit, the infinite intelligence of the universe, has already said yes to our prayer. And so our prayer is not to change God's mind, but to change ours, to lift our consciousness, to be open, willing, receptive vessels. And that's what I claim for each and every one of us today, that we are open, willing vessels for God's greater good to be revealed by means of us. So we include in our prayer today our family members and friends, our parents and children, everyone who we hold near and dear, everyone who's in our heart. And we remember that God, in its fullness, in its allness, is right there where they are. Healing, ministering, uplifting, supplying, revealing truth in perfect ways for all of those people that we love. And we think about the world that we live in. And we remind ourselves it's easy to be caught up in appearance, but our teaching is to focus on the inner spiritual truth. That we are metaphysicians, we're interested in what's beyond the physical. And so I know beyond the physical, there is a spiritual truth that makes each and every one of us and everyone in our world more free. And this is the, the truth that God has placed in the heart and mind of every individual. I know it's there. So all of those situations that cry for our attention, we say God is present as healing, as right action, as peace, as all needs met. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams and all paths to God and all paths that don't look like their paths. We bless them all. Because on the unseen side of life, we are all connected. We are all one in the mind and in the heart of God. And so with a full heart, I give thanks that this is the truth right here, right now. And I release this word. And so it is. Together we all say, 